Well, I got waylaid talking to people about their stuff, and so often <laughs> that happens. So I apologise for my late start. Um, the uh, one thing I'd like to say too is many of you do send uh, emails to myself and Mary, and uh, obviously we don't get a chance to respond to hardly any of them. And uh, we try to read as many as we can. Um, but a lot of times the questions that, we, that are, we're asked, we've often already answered um, in these kind of sessions with lots of different questions that come up. And many times too, um, we're, with the ones that we haven't answered, for instance, those of you who are asking all these questions about soulmates at the moment, um, we haven't answered a whole series of those questions because myself and Mary would like to do a presentation of uh, about the subject of soulmates in which you can ask all those questions. So what we'd like to do, if you can just bear that in mind when you send your emails to us, that it's actually physically impossible <coughs> for us to answer all of your questions. Um, obviously if you have quite a few messages coming in a day, sometimes uh, quite a few, uh, like 100 or so, it's impossible for you to actually uh, answer every one of those in a and most of the answers, as you know from these sessions, are quite long. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's impossible to type up the answers too, in many cases. And of course, myself and Mary are working through our emotions together all the time. And that is our, still our highest priority. So, so if you could just bear that in mind. Um, and, and this is why it's also good for you to, when the opportunity comes up in these sessions, ask the questions. And many of you are still concerned about privacy and worry that your situation is unique. And to be frank with you, there are literally, you've probably got literally 15, 20, 30 different situations that are in your life that you believe are unique that literally, you know, a good 10, 15% of this audience probably have experienced during their life as well. Yeah, we're saying with regard to your emotional injuries, you're not so special. <laughs> With regard to your true soul condition, of course you're special. Right? But as regards to our soul injuries, yeah, we, we often have a very, very much the same kind of patterns, particularly if we're in the same country uh, as other people. Uh, we often have very, very similar emotional injuries uh, that are often reflected in the questions. So if you can be brave enough to ask questions, you will always finish up with some good answers, not only for yourselves, but for all of those persons who weren't brave enough to ask them. Uh, so it's actually doing everyone else a favour as well when you put your heart and, and life on the line. Um, you're not going to join me, Dan? Or... <laughs> you can if you want. Um, it'll be sometime in the new year. Um, we, oh, by the way, if I, I don't know if I've... I think I've told all of you that we've cancelled the first weekend session in January. Um, myself and Mary were just coming back from two, uh, nearly two, two and a half week trips away and so we felt we wanted to have some time together to work through some things. When we go on a trip we have a lot of things come up generally and uh, the last trip we had was quite intense emotionally for both of us wasn't it darling and, um, and then we only had a few days home again and then off off again so not quite enough time to deal with it so what we're trying to do now is structure our uh, presentations where we've got that time of two weeks or so uh, to deal with stuff. Um, so the first weekend in January is cancelled so we may finish up doing a soulmate session in the last week in Jan January or the first in February but I don't know yet it just depends on our um, I generally don't anymore because um, I, I want to allow the law of attraction to bring the subject. There's a lot of subjects at the moment that I really would like to discuss with, with you as a group and, um, and I can think of many subjects that are probably more important for a person's soul development than the soulmate issue. Um, that bearing in mind, obviously it's a very, it's a subject close to our heart. So. Um, it's certainly something we want to present in the future, uh, but it will probably be in the first half or first, first third, maybe of, of next year. Yeah. We 
We've got talks in Brisbane as well, starting in January again, is it? Uh, January the 20-something, 5th I think it is. It's a, it's a Monday night actually, we've man, been able to arrange some talks. Uh, 25th wasn't it of January and the 8th of February and the 29th of March. Uh, some talks that we've got uh, organised for, uh, they were all Monday evenings. Um, so the reason why we've done that, it, it are three hour talks, not four, so they'll be from seven till ten. The reason why we've done that is that uh, we, we come here, we'll do the weekend and then we'll go down to Brisbane, do the Monday evening and then go back home basically. Uh, so it's, it's convenient um, from, the, from our perspective in terms of giving us enough time to do our own emotional work. Um, so, so that's what's happening and we've also got a trip coming up overseas uh, to, to New Zealand. I don't know whether you call that overseas, many of us. <laughs> but um, and, uh, but uh, we're not, it, it doesn't matter to us whether there's many groups that are going to be happening there or not because if there's not, I've never seen New Zealand so it'll be a good opportunity for me to have a bit of a visit. Mary's been there before but um, we're, we're looking forward to just catching up with a few people over there while we're there and me check, I'd, I'd love to check out a bit of the South Island so, um, in particular. So we're looking forward to that then. And then when we come back, um, we're not sure how long uh, we will be in Australia uh, after that cause, but we don't at this stage have any desire really to go overseas uh, further afield. Um, so, and Peter was just saying to me that um, at the moment there's no sales happening with regard to the, um, the, the venue that he's offered us here. Um, so you, those of you who are praying for that to happen, that's not on, mate. You've, got to <laughs> <laughs> You've just got to... <laughs> um, but, um, so we've got the venue for, for some time, just depending on circumstances, but possibly another six months at least or so. Yeah, um, just certainly. And, and, uh, and Anna too, wherever Anna is. Is she here at the moment? Don't, where is she? She's gone out for a walk. She's gone out for a walk. <laughs> Do some processing. She did, yeah. So, um, yeah, so uh, it's great that we have that available. It was lovely to have been able to have a dance. We, we were thinking that we might have it a bit more often. Yeah. Uh, so. So we'll see how that goes over the coming months. Um, and uh, um, we just feel too, uh, there's a likelihood that Mary, some of the Mary sessions that she's been talking about will happen here probably upstairs as well. So um, it's been a lovely venue that we can do those things, those things in too. Anyway, back to the subject at hand. How are you coping with it so far? Yeah. Okay, well what I wanted to do is just look at some of the comments that have been made to me, some of the very illogical comments sometimes <laughs> that have been made to me and we'll just start to uh, try to identify some of the underlying emotions to do with these particular comments and projections. Does that make sense? So, and this will help you too when other people project at you very, very similar types of emotions. You see, in your own development what's going to happen is as you develop yourself more and more emotionally, you will begin to see very, very clearly in other people what's going on emotionally for them. And if you have an idea of what's happening for them emotionally, you can hone in on the emotion rather than the comment. You see, most often in our, in our interactions with others, what we're doing is we're interacting very much most of the time at an intellectual level. So such and such makes a comment like, Oh, but Paget messages say, duh, 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 and off they go, right? So that's one of the comments. So one of the comments about my, my identity. The Paget messages, this is an example, messages say, there is no reincarnation. So how can AJ be Jesus? The Paget messages say there's no re reincarnation, right? <coughs> Mind you, before the pageant message, it was, the Bible says. <laughs> right? Whatever the Bible says. And therefore it can't be true. So the Bible says that Jesus would be coming on a cloud with angels and they'd come and slaughter all the wicked and all the righteous would be left over. And if this guy isn't doing that, then he's not Jesus. 
Uh, that's what the Bible says. Right? <coughs> and then, of course, you get other people say, oh, the Bible says that there will be false Christs. You know, the Antichrist. AJ is the Antichrist. Right? <laughs> so, you know, there's all sorts of things like that said too. Now, any of these things are basically, um, what, are, what emotions are behind this? Why do I need somebody else who's written down something, in this case a hundred years ago, in this case thousands of years ago, that I feel I must believe in deference to trusting my own self emotionally? In other words, I'm willing to accept what the Bible says even though emotionally it doesn't feel good. So, did you know the Bible actually says that... Um, well, I can bring quite a few examples here of what the Bible says that you wouldn't be too pleased about. But, but the Bible actually says that there is justified homicide. Like in the, in the Hebrew scriptures of the Bible, the Old Testament, it says that uh, God told Joshua to kill everyone in the city of Jericho, which they besieged. They besieged it, and the Bible says that God told Joshua to obliterate everyone. How does that feel emotionally to you? Is that the kind of God you want to get to know? No. So obviously, you know, there's a lot of unloving things in that statement. Now, why would a person then say, but the Bible says that there is this justified violence? And then bring up that as, a, as, an, as an option. Why, what emotion in the person would cause them to feel that? Why would they feel they have to trust this written word that was written many, in the case of the Bible, thousands of years ago, about an event? There's got to be something about them not being able to trust their own emotional assessment of what's loving. Can you see that? And so what they do instead is trust what somebody else says is the right thing to do. Yeah, just something on that. That's one of the first um, emotions that came up for me with um, the doubt. Not in what you're saying, but obviously who you were. Yep. Um, was I was expecting something outside of myself to be told to me to believe it. Yep. Like I was expecting it to, in the future, perhaps hear it on the news or someone famous is going to be bringing it up and then I can believe it. Yeah. 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 As long as a famous person isn't Jesus. <laughs> you can't say that. But yeah, I see what you're saying. <laughs> it's interesting how Jesus, who's a famous person, can't say that he's Jesus, but somebody else can say he's Jesus and get away with it. Anyway. So yeah, the Bible says and the pageant messages say all we're trying to do there is, is get rid of a lot of fears. We're basically di we're disclaiming any personal responsibility for what we believe is truth. Can you see that? As soon as we trust something outside of ourselves, we're, tr we're disclaiming any personal responsibility for what we believe is truth. So even when you say, but AJ says, you are disclaiming any personal responsibility for what you believe is truth. Do you believe what AJ is saying to you or not? So stop saying AJ says and say, I believe. Can you see the relationship there? Do you believe it or not? If you don't believe it, say, I don't believe it. But AJ says, that's fine. But if you believe it, stop saying, oh, AJ says, when really it's, I believe. Da, 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 da. Oh, statement. Yeah, because the statement itself is actually saying that you don't trust your own belief system. Right? Nino, you know, can you microphone so we'll need? Just down the front here it is. Sorry. You need to keep your hand up, Nino. Thanks. I find myself saying that AJ says mainly because I don't want to take, um, I want to acknowledge you in what you've taught me. Do you understand where I'm saying? So that to but I'm not teaching you anything, right. really. So it's, we're sharing God's truth. Yeah, we're sharing God's truth. Right. In the end, God's truth will either resonate with you or it will not. Right. The bits that resonate with you, I feel God feels this. The bits that don't resonate with you, AJ says, blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> right? Because you don't yet believe it's your own yet. Right? 
So let yourself acknowledge your own belief system, your own feelings about the matter. And understand too that the truth changes. This is the other problem with this kind of quotation of this said that or this said that, is that does that mean that if the Bible 2,000 years ago, well the latest time uh, that it was changed was actually a lot more recent than that, but let's say it came from 2,000 years ago, that means that all the truth was delivered to mankind 2,000 years ago and no one since then has discovered any more truth. <coughs> now does that sound like a logical proposition to you? Um, because as humans we have infinite potential. Truth is never absolute, truth is never finite. So by saying that it was all delivered 2,000 years ago, we're actually limiting ourselves and our own potential and Can I God's this potential. Can I about truth being never absolute though? Uh, uh, yes, you can. Because I, can't, but, I can't find the word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God's truth is obviously absolute, but our understanding of God's truth is going to be infinitely progressive because God's infinite, therefore God's truth is infinite and God has the, is the possessor of absolute truth, right? But I do not know absolute truth. All I know is a portion of that truth. Yeah, and I was trying to refer to as well the potentialities within God's universe. Mm. Perhaps you can... That are infinite. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. And because of that, the truth actually is that more truth is arriving in the universe at any possible moment. Because God created um, her universe with different potentialities. So they already exist within the universe and as we grow or as different things happen, they come into existence. So there's never any one... Um, point in time where the universe exists as it will always exist. Yeah. So like 3,000 years ago, there are six, the six spheres or six dimensions in the universe. Right? Now there's 22 of them. So something changed. So that means the truth actually changed, but God created the potential for that to occur through God's laws and principles. Right? So the truth is that if I said to you 3,000 years ago, there are only six dimensional spaces and then I said to you, it's never going to be any different. That's when I now add a harmony with truth. Can you see that? Like when, when I say there are six spheres and I'm living 3,000 years ago, that's true. But if I then say that that's the only spheres that are ever going to exist, now I'm not speaking the truth anymore because the potential exists even 3,000 years ago for more than six dimensions to exist. Does that make sense to everyone? And that's very important to see that God's truth is going to be, my understanding of God's truth is constantly going to change. So my understanding is constantly changing. My, right now my understanding is constantly changing. You see, many of you feel that if I'm Jesus I should know all of God's truth and I'd be able to state it all without it ever changing. But that's how, how does that work? Like I can't do that. No, no person can do that. God only knows the truth to that extent. No one else in the universe is ever going to know the truth to that extent. All we can do, hope to do is grow towards it. So the problem with this statement and this one is that it's fixing people into a teaching that now cannot grow. Does that make sense? So what emotion would cause that? So what causes that? Fear of what? Change. Fear of change. How much fear of change is there on this planet? Huge. Like, we, we don't want to change anything. Like, there's the technology to have totally different method of transportation than we currently have. Why doesn't it change? Because everyone's afraid of it changing. You know, the oil companies are afraid of it changing. The government's afraid of it changing because they take, you know, like 70% of the money that comes from the oil companies. Everybody's afraid of it changing, so it doesn't change. Right? And that's just one thing with regard to the vehicles you're driving. Right? What about the money system? Does the money system work for you? Well, it might, not, might work for you, but it's not working for a good two-thirds of the world, right? Is it? Most of them live in like, abject poverty, if not near starvation. So do you think the money system's changing? But what happens is we all live in fear because we get our little nest egg and whatever, and then we want to protect that nest egg. You know, we're worried about changing the system so that everyone can have some. Can you see we're so afraid of change? Right down to a personal level. 
How many of you don't want to give up a relationship that's not working? <laughs> like I've personally lived in relationships that haven't worked for five, six, seven, eight years and I still didn't want to give them up. Why? Afraid of change. And all this is, all those kind of reasoning is just fear of change, right? being afraid. Notice how all of these things get back. So the pageant messages say, Jesus can't be alive on earth today. Well, the pageant messages don't actually say that, right, for a start. But our logic will kick in because it's what we want to believe. The pageant messages actually say that truth is infinite. The pageant messages actually say that truth is an ever-increasing thing because we're increasing from where we are to where God is. It does say that God's truth is infinite, but it doesn't say that the pageant messages is the only messages that are God's truth. Right? It doesn't say that at all, even in the pageant messages themselves. Right? It does say that they are the most truth that was presented 100 years ago than any other truth that was around at that time. But that doesn't preclude my or Mary or another six soul pairs from reincarnating. All that does is demonstrate what we believed 100 years ago. <laughs> just like the Bible demonstrates what we believed 2,000 years ago. Does that make sense to everyone? So every holy book that's ever been on this planet is a snapshot in time of what the belief system was. That's really all it is. And if I base the rest of my life on that snapshot, then I'm being quite foolish because I'm not understanding the truth that divine truth is infinite. So therefore, I'm precluding any truth from entering me after that point. Yeah. So we've got to look at, again, our emotional reasons for saying the things we say and for feeling even the things we feel because there's always emotions underneath them. Is there any other questions about... Do you want to know what the Bible says? <laughs> there are bits of what the Bible says that are true, right? Just like there are bits of every holy book you read that are true. It doesn't make it God's word. Because God's word is infinite. How, if God's word is infinite, how can you fit it in a book? And how big would the book be? You'd be like, <laughs> carrying, <laughs> carrying around a sack with you. Oh, this is a little bit of God's truth like, <laughs> that I'm learning today. That, and the truth is that that's what it's like, isn't it? That God's truth, uh, as it enters you emotionally at the soul level, you'll find it's totally different experience than you just carrying around a book of truths. So while it's great to have a book of truths called the Paget Messages, right, that is not the finite truth and can never be. Right? And if I say to you sometime in the future, what I'm telling you is the only truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. And <laughs> what will happen is that God won't be able to help me. Because from that point I'm actually saying a untruth. There is always things that are going to be discovered in the future. Hey Jay, and we don't, we don't have to remember those truths either because they'll, they fit, we feel them when we're doing wrong. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The beauty of the soul, the beauty of God's way is that with God's way, intellectually you don't even have to learn the truth. Because what happens is, and there is a truth in the Bible that this is a statement about, that the truth actually enters your heart and becomes a part of your nature. So you can't, you can't physically break it anymore. And some of you have already experienced that. Where you, where you go to do something that you used to do, but your soul's changed so much that it just feels incredibly uncomfortable and you can't do it. Yeah. And nobody could even force you to do it. Right? So whereas before you might have gotten forced to go to war, for example, how many of you feel you could do that now? Like, would you now be conscientious objectors compared to what you would have been before? Can you see how just some truths settle in you and whammo, things change and now you can't do something that's in error? Yeah, my experience of that is um, I started to, to write a lot to my family and whenever I wrote something that wasn't right, it, it stuck me, it, you know, 
you felt and I had to change it. Yeah. I really had to change it. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything else but. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the beauty of the divine truth entering your soul, is that now it's part of your nature. You can't, you can't do anything about it. Sorry about that. Um, but you can't do anything about it after it's entered you. You know, it, it just resonates so much inside of you. Sometimes you would like to, you know, be, be different. Like, uh, I, I was thinking of uh, when I was processing through some emotions um, about soulmates and everything, this was some time ago, and I was, I was thinking, I wish I could just go out and have an affair. <laughs> right? I wish I could just do that. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I, I never could really, but sometimes you... you you wish you would like, you'd like to be able to do something. You know, for, for instance, you might have a feeling of an emotion towards the, the per par, party that's done that to you, right? And then, then you feel like, oh, I would like to do that in return just so they can feel what it feels like on the other end, right? But you can't because inside of you to do it would just be like so, so self-destructive you just couldn't do it, right? And this is the beauty of the truth entering you is the truth entering you changes your soul so much that in the end you don't need another person outside of you to tell you what the truth is. Or a rule book. Or a rule book, yeah. I was just thinking about Joy's question before the break um, about wanting to resolve this issue around um, AJ's identity and I thought maybe I would share just a few of the emotions that I mm. yeah, um, have felt and I'm still working my way through a lot of them but one of the big things that came up for me um, well, there's been a lot, but um, AJ and I met each other and um, all of these amazing things happened and I got really triggered and we, we broke up. And um, I tried to be off the divine love path, as I think I've shared with all of you, and that was unbearable. Um, and I remember having a discussion with him uh, right before we sort of came back together and I said... I don't know how, like, I don't know how to trust that this is true because if it's not, if all of these beautiful things that I feel are true, if I, if I trust this and it turns out to be wrong, I will be absolute, I won't be able to live anymore. Like, I'll be so devastated. And I guess that, that was highlighting a big fear that I have about, um, placing my trust in love and hope and truth and that's been a big block for me in um, trusting the teachings, trusting AJ, trusting um, this path for myself. So it's not always the obvious things that are just about him being Jesus. Um, there's been a lot of things like that for me. Uh, my fear of rejection um, and ostracism has been a huge block. It's not... I. It's not directly about AJ either, but if I, I realise that inside of myself, if I um, opened my heart to the possibility and really felt the truth of it, um, then I, I felt I'll definitely be ostracised by everyone. And so I was blocking this process all of the time because I hadn't dealt with this fear of ostracism. So, yeah, um, I'm just trying to think of any other ones that I've... I don't know, you put me on the spot now. Um, I suppose it's. Good. I was just trying to highlight just that um, a lot of our emotions um, are not so obvious, but when you go to this space of going, okay, this guy's Jesus, and um, I think, I feel like that's probably, like, he, feel, he seems right to me, but to actually conceive that on a big scale. There's lots of emotions that get triggered and they're the blocks to really feeling for ourselves. Like what I concluded was I s that I couldn't decide if it was Jesus or not until I dealt with all those emotions, until I dealt with the fear of ostracism, until I dealt with this disillusionment with love feeling that I had, those kinds of things. So, Because when, when Mary first met me, within about, would have been about a week, you were pretty angry with me, weren't you? And for saying that you're Jesus. For saying that I was Jesus, yeah. So Mary went, like, she was very happy hearing about the teachings, but she was very angry with me for saying that I was Jesus. I think I actually said, well, if he is Jesus, why does he have to tell anyone? Why can't he just shut up about I've it? I've heard this very many times, right? And so, and so um, once, we start, once we start delving into that emotionally, why as a woman 
that I've never met before, angry, so angry that she's livid with me about saying I'm Jesus. There's got to be some emotions, right? And this is the extent of it. I knew I'd met AJ, I'd been to a couple of his talks, I knew who he was saying he was and he'd referred to it in the talks and I'd gotten really angry. And then a bit of time passed and we talked a bit and I got delivered to me by Tristan the first Secrets of the Universe talk because I didn't go. I, I wanted to go but I just didn't. Yeah. Anyway, um, I was sitting down watching this DVD. I know what he is going to say. It, the event has occurred, it's in the past. But I was literally lying on the couch with a cushion over my face. <laughs> I couldn't look at the screen because I didn't want him to say it so much. So I had a lot of fear, which was under the anger. And embarrassment. Embarrassment, fear for him. Um, yeah, crazy amounts of emotion. Yeah. And so every time somebody would ask me a question in an audience about being Jesus, the worst projections I'd get would be from Mary. Like, it'd be like, <laughs> so it's like, I can feel all this terrible ter feeling of terror from my soulmate, you know. Like, <laughs> and because I'm so in tune with Mary's emotions generally, it's like, I don't know if I can give an answer to this question. <laughs> like, not because of the person asking it, but because of Mary's projection, right? And, and <coughs> like for you, um, <coughs> A lot of it was about the deep emotional hurt that you had within yourself, wasn't it? That you started to identify when we were four days after we, we met up in uh, overseas. And I think the incredible terror that I've started to work through about people harming us physically um, mm. and harming you physically, yeah. yeah. So, and I went through these, as a result of that, I went through these terrible emotions about, ah, oh, Mary, like, the worst possible thing I could have said to my soulmate is, hi, I'm Jesus. <laughs> Do you want to hook up? <laughs> I think I said that to him. It's not a, such a good pick-up line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, like, this is where uh, I think it's quite funny, really, when I read different comments about, about Mary somehow being influenced by me, like, and by me saying that I'm Jesus. Because... Mary has had the most antagonism towards me saying I'm Jesus than anybody I've met, pretty much. Right? Anyone? Oh, yeah, pretty much, initially. Yeah. But, you know, obviously some people have, in the long term, had some. Like, so they've known me for a while, know that I'm saying Jesus, they accept that for a while, and then they get triggered by something I say, and then they get angry and frustrated. But, but right from day one, pretty much, it was pretty full on, wasn't it? So... And that feeling was in you too. So something to bear in mind about Mary's experience is if you have a big emotion or reaction within yourself, then there is usually a big underlying grief associated with that emotion. So what I've had a lot of people say to me is, oh, you're a nice fella, AJ, but you're not my Jesus. Well, that's, that betrays quite a lot of emotion. What's the emotion? Oh, not my Jesus. Jesus somehow belongs to me. I've got a personal relationship with Jesus that's not like that I don't feel with you, you know, and all those kind of things. So, and in fact, one f fellow said to me that he channels Jesus. And of course, every person who channels Jesus often is in deep anger and rage with me when I say who I am. Why, do you think? Well, they have an emotional investment in the fact that they're channeling Jesus. What, what would you feel if you're channeling Jesus? Oh, no good, I've got this... Jesus with me, isn't it wonderful? Like, can I just go, mm. like, <laughs> what's any different than Jesus, me being with you, than anybody else? Like, honestly, you, you're all just as important as me or, or not as important as me, but, you know, we're both, we're, both, we're of equal importance, aren't we, right? And uh, <clears throat> I think my thing's going out. And, and that, bearing that in mind, if we're of equal importance, then why would you feel any special occasion like channeling Jesus compared to channeling like Joe Bloggs down the road. Can you see? Well, you did do some amazing things in the first century. Yeah, I didn't do any amazing things in the first century, though. You demonstrated some amazing things. Yeah, see, this is another error that people have. I didn't do any amazing things in the first century. I just meant at one moment. I didn't mean the other stuff. Yeah, but I, like... I didn't do any amazing things in the first century, nor did I do any amazing things in the spirit world that none of you can't do. Right? God did 
things through me by my condition of abundance with God. Just like God is going to do things through you because of your condition of abundance with God. Does that make sense? So it's not me even. So when, you know, you have all the accounts of the miracles that happened in the first century, you know, all these people that were healed, I didn't heal them. God healed them. And all I became, all I had, des had a desire to do was to be the vehicle through which God did that. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. yeah. Um, could we go to Jan at the back and then Nina? Is this related to that? Uh, go on, Nina. Yeah, just... And then Jenna. How, how much or how important is it that the person had faith in that immensely, process of the healing? Immensely important, yeah, immensely important. Because obviously if a person didn't have faith or even didn't have a desire at the moment of the healing to deal with their emotional condition, God couldn't heal them because God would have been breaking her own laws to heal them. So God used this connection through myself to heal Right, to be, if you like, the masculine expression of divinity through myself, to heal others, just like what's going to happen for many of you, whether you're a male, it, you'll become the masculine expression of God, through God, by God working through you when you become at one with God. And if you're a female, you'll become like the feminine expression of God working through you when you become at one with God. And, and then God will enact her laws through you. God's not going to break her own laws through you. You're not going to be able to go around healing every single person on the planet, right? Why not? Because to do that, God would have to break her own laws. You see, God's perfectly capable of healing every single person on this planet right at this moment if God decided to break her own laws. Right? The truth is that God's never going to decide to break her own laws. To do that would create universal anarchy. So, the only time that healing is going to occur on this planet is when we bring our own truth and our own desires and our own lives into harmony with God's laws. And one of the harmonious things is faith. So when I exercise faith in God to heal me, I, can ha I have a stronger connection. What it actually does is it raises my condition of love temporarily enough for spirits and others to work through me. This is the benefit of faith. Faith is such a positive thing because it raises our condition above where we are to a new location even though we're not yet in that new location and that allows God's love to work through us in a greater capacity than it would if our condition didn't have any faith. F not having faith blocks you actually from connecting to God. Right? So all these Bible things about faith, some of them are true, but many of them that faith is something that's, um, you know, something that you can't, see or connect with or that's justified, a lot of those are untrue. There is a law of faith and we'll talk about that law in, a later, in later discussions. Yeah? But just to, again allow ourselves to look at this, the fact that when I bring myself into harmony with God's laws, even into harmony with one of those laws, I actually allow God now to work through me to a greater extent. Now when you become at one with God, you're allowing God to work through you completely. That's all that happened in the first century. And I just happened to be the first person to get into that condition because when God was saying, who can I send, who can I send, my soul, our soul, of which I'm a half, said, I want you to be able to send me. Just like your soul is saying now, I want you to be able to send me as well. Does that make sense? Up the back, if we can go. Um, oh, sorry, Jen, and then up the back. Could we open up the discussion as to what's happening in the spirit world in terms of um, your identity and you coming back here um, f for the support for you as Jesus and the opposition? Sure. And, and it's a, a valid point with regard to what's happening in terms of how Mary and myself in particular get attacked. So let's look at what's going on in the spirit world. You could divide the spirit world into probably three primary camps on this issue. There's what you would call the natural love camps. Now those, the spirits in that camp 
basically feel that I can't be Jesus because the Jesus they've heard of is actually in a better condition where they are. So when they come to investigate me, um, and particularly in the past, they see things in me that they feel are not holy or acceptable to God. So one of the things they see in me is that I like to make love to my beautiful soulmate, right? And, and they see that as a major issue, right? Because many of them who have reached the sixth fear in natural love believe that you have to be celibate and not sexual to be connected to God, for example. So when you go and ask one of your spirit friends with you, is AJ Jesus? you're going to get three different types of people connecting to you with regard to the answers. This is one type, the natural love spirits who are in a state of natural love but are not in a state of understanding divine love. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. Then there's this second camp which are the celestial spirits. But not just the celestial spirits but also all the spirits who are on the divine love path. Remember you can be on the divine love path and still be in the first sphere of the spirit world. Right? So you can be in the first sphere, second sphere, third sphere, right up through, all through any dimension and also the celestial spirits. All of the celestial spirits know that Jesus, Mary Magdalene and others, Cornelius and others like that are on the earth at the moment. They all know how we got here. They even watched the process of how we got here. Right? So they actually know the actual process of how we got here. They also know how much we've limited ourselves to come here. They know all sorts of things that as yet you have not even been told about with regard to our return. Does that make sense? So that's that group of spirits. And then you've got this other group of spirits which we will call the malevolent, malevolent spirits. Now these spirits up in natural love, they're not malevolent in the sense that they're not attacking AJ all the time. What they, but what they're doing is they're going down the track of saying, yeah, it's not possible, it can't be possible, we don't understand how it could be possible. Intellectually they do not understand how this reincarnation could have occurred. Does that make sense? And so intellectually they say, well, we don't understand how it could have occurred, so it couldn't have occurred. Because remember, when you're in that state, you're in a state of very high self-reliance. You're quite intelligent and so you believe you know everything pretty much. Right? You believe you know most things anyway. And so what you do is you go down the track of supposing that if you don't know about it then it can't be true. Right? Which is a very dangerous point that you think about it, there's still a lot of people on earth who think that, right? And in the spirit world that's uh, carried over. These malevolent spirits are a bit different. These malevolent spirits are like they do not, they might know the truth but they do not want it to happen. Right? They are actively in opposition to any of this truth coming known on the earth. Every time I open my mouth, they see a problem. I've had groups of, and by the way, some of them are religious. I've had groups of religious spirits who know that I'm Jesus who would like to kill me. I'm talking Christian religious spirits who know that I'm Jesus who have come to me but they still want to kill me. Right? because they see me as the destroyer of what they established, which was a whole mechanism to control and so forth. So there's religious spirits. There's political spirits. Why do you think they want to get rid of us? Polit... You count, sorry, what was the... Money changes. Yeah, it's all to do with the money changes, isn't it? The economics, but also what's political politics? It's about power and control, isn't it? Like. So what are we talking about here? What we're talking about is that God eventually will become the ruler of mankind. That's what we're really talking about. In the end, all of this presentation is about God actually, you actually submitting, yes, you are going to need to submit, you're going to surrender to God's laws for a change. Rather than try to live breaking God's laws all the time and feeling the consequences, what will happen in your progression is you'll surrender to God's laws eventually and what that will create is huge amounts of bliss and happiness for you, right? But you'll surrender to God's laws, but do these political spirits want you to do that? Of course not. Can they manipulate you with fear if you do this? No. Like, if somebody, if somebody comes up and puts a gun to your head and says, you do this or else, right? And you say, well, I'm okay with the or else. Like, what can they do? There's nothing they can do. 
And then they, they say, all right, what about with your child? Put the gun to the child's head and, you, and you're still okay with the or else. What are they going to do then? There's nothing they can do, is there? Right? And so, so these kind of spirits, they don't want this truth to be known on the planet. Right? Then you've got the economic system, which is actually behind the political powers. It actually controls the entire politics of this planet. Right? Now there's a whole group of spirits in the spirit world who are just in that state. They, all they want to do is to maintain the current disparity of economics on the earth. That's their entire mission in life. Why? Because it gives them control. It, from the spirit, this, this earth is not controlled by governments on this earth. It is controlled by these spirits who control the governments on this earth. Right? And these spirits are very antagonistic towards any truth being known on the earth and particularly antagonistic towards any time you don't live in fear. That's their goal. And then there's a whole other group of spirits who are interested in connecting to you emotionally and living through you their unhealed emotions, right? Which is a large number, like there's billions and billions of those spirits who want to connect to you through your emotions. Shall we call, call them emotional right. leeches? Right? What they're doing is they're using your unhealed emotions to control you in your day-to-day -day life every single moment they can. That's what they're doing. Now, do they want you to know the truth? No. Of course not. Now, these ones are often not very organised because, you know, they're just interacting with individuals, right? So these ones, when I go up and meet the individual, they're going straight away to that person, don't you do have anything to do with this person? Don't you have anything to do with him? Don't you listen to him? Don't you act upon anything he says? I'll make you go to sleep. And before you know it, you're sleepy, <laughs> tired, whatever, right? Just shut you down so that you don't hear because they want to maintain their hold on you, their control on you. Remember the divine love path is all about you no longer being controlled by anything other than God's love operating through you. Now... They don't want that. They want to control you, right? Now, I get accused of wanting to control people all the time. But who of you personally has ever experienced me controlling you? It's interesting, isn't it? Every person who meets me never experiences me controlling them, but they still, I still get accused of being controlling, <laughs> which is interesting. The reason why is because the, these accusations often come from the spirit world through the person. He's going to control you. He's going to manipulate you. you know, be, fr be frightened of him. Be frightened of him. Right? Yes, they are frightened of me because of what is being taught. What's being taught is for you to eventually be your own person with your own desires, your own passions, your own longings, connected with God, living your life as you know is in harmony with everything to do with God's universe. You, in that state, you do not need an economy. You do not need any politicians. You do not need any religious leaders. You do not need Jesus. You do not need any single person outside of yourself in that state. Now, any person who has an investment in you being reliant on them or them being reliant on you is going to feel opposed to that teaching. So can you see why your family might be opposed to that teaching? Why? Because we've got emotional hook here, emotional hook there, and before we know it, you know, all of a sudden we start breaking away from these emotional hooks. What happens to the family members? They all start going into meltdown. I'm not getting what I want from this person anymore. This is exactly the same as what these spirits are doing. I'm not getting what I want from this person anymore. This person's not giving me the things that I need so that I can live through them on the earth because I don't want to live through them where I am in the spirit world. I, I can't live through, through them if I stay in the spirit world without this link, right? So what they're doing is they're focusing their attention on the earth, on people who they can manipulate and control so that they can feel their own stuff that they haven't resolved. And they don't want to work through it. They just want to feel it. So if they're a sexual pervert, they want to find a person who has got an emotion with regard to a certain issue, with regard to their mum or their dad, 
and they want to, uh, that's a sexual type of issue, or it might not even be a sexual issue. It might be a simple issue like feeling needed or wanted from the opposite gender. And then what they do is they manipulate that and work on that until they get the person into sexual perversion, and then they can just realise their own emotional stuff that they want to have through that person on earth. Now, if someone comes along and says, oh, do you realise you've got a spirit connected with you, and what he's doing is setting up all your sexual liaisons, and the person goes, what? I didn't know that. And then they feel that to be true. What's going to happen then? Is this spirit going to be able to control them anymore? If they deal with the underlying causal emotion which causes the attraction? No. So what, what's going to happen then? The spirit's going to have to go off and find somebody else. And this spirit may have been with you for 20 years or 30 years. That's a lot of trouble, isn't it? It's like, I've got to go off and find someone else now? You, you've got to be joking. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hammer this person <laughs> until he gets back into line, right? And this is why many of you finish up having what I would call a spiritual warfare of your soul. So you're in a battle for your soul. There's a lot of people who want to control your soul. Lots of people in the spirit world and here on earth. You're in a battle for your soul. Do you want to be the ultimate controller of your own soul? where you have God flowing through you and, and therefore you acting on your desires that are harmonious with love and truth? Or do you want to have all these other people having control of your soul? That's really what this gets down to in the end. So there's this group of malevolent spirits, in answer to your question, Jen, that want to just make sure the truth is not known and does not grow. This is why many of you who have begun your emotional work in earnest have found initial parts of lots of feelings of opposition inside of yourself because you have these spirits who just don't want you doing this. Now the beauty of the truth is it's powerful and in the end the truth will overcome all of those people who want to talk about error. So this group of spirits here are a bit easier to identify as people who are opposite, in opposition to you. You can feel often that you know, they're, manip they're manipulating you. You can often feel their promptings. Um, do you want to mention about that group of ladies who were with you just a day or two ago? Yeah. Who've been with you a lot of your life. Yeah. Um, I'll just uh, tune back into that. Um, I had a session with Shannon and um, I had been... Uh, yeah, I had a session with Shannon and... Um, uh, during the session she sensed a group of female spirits with me and um, we just chatted about it briefly at the end. I, I went into processing something different during the session. Um, but afterwards I started to tune into them and um, feeling their emotions. And their emotions, um, they used to have fun when I used to drink. And all of my boyfriends used to say, oh, I wouldn't have to drink very much for this. So what happens to you when you drink? You get nasty, it's terrible, la la. So these women uh, influenced me not only when I was drinking as well. Um, they had a lot of strong feelings about men. They've been punished. Um, uh, they've been abused rather in their life. And their emotions are still um, that they would like to punish any man. And... Um, I tried talking to them about divine truth and that kind of thing and they're not interested at all. They, they're really happy with their arrangement and uh, they just really like to punish any man indiscriminately because they feel it's not right for them. Um, they've suffered enough and they don't want to look at anything else. They're really unhappy that they're in pain. And we, we, we start, I started a conversation with them and Mary started yawning all the time. Like, she was yawning, so, and it was uncontrollable oh, yawning, wasn't yeah. it? Like you're just yawning all the time in the conversation. And then I started to try and process my own emotional hook into them, which um, interestingly eludes me now because it wasn't that I had the same emotion. There was two emotions. Wasn't there? There was a oh, fear of women's anger, fear of older women's anger, uh, which is big for me. Um, and so I, try, I started to try and process that. And I, was cry I felt it, I was crying and yawning. And we were sitting in the car and it was, it was constant. Um, it was really... So she'd difficult. start crying again and then she'd yawn again and stop crying. And then she'd start crying again and she'd yawn again and stop crying. And, and this kept on going on and on for a while, didn't it? Well, for, for an hour and a half or so. Yeah. 
So, so there's some spirits just there hooked into Mary staying the same, hooked into that. Like, and many of us have spirits hooked into us that just totally want us to stay the same as we all already are. They don't care about anything else. Okay. We go out the back there next to John. Yeah. Is, is that what yawning is? Is that spirits attached to you, stopping you feel your emotion generally? Um, um, please don't think it's always that. But a lot of times it is that, yes. Um, a lot of these things that we do physically are a lot of the times um, the results of spirits prompting us. Like, do you know where you've sat in an audi audience and you just, you want to hear the material, you want to hear the material, you feel it like within you and you're off to sleep, right? What went on there? Somebody doesn't want you to hear the material. Just simple as that. So when I was saying to these spirits with Mary, actually, you guys... I said, you girls are quite gutless, actually, right? So I was quite direct with them. I said, the reason why you're gutless is because you get a man who didn't actually hurt you and who's never going to hurt you and you try and torment him as much as you possibly can. You'd be far better off, and I don't agree, I don't agree that they should do this, but, and I said that to them, but I said, you'd be better off getting the men that hurt you and doing that to them. That would be more, that would show a bit more character, a strength of character, wouldn't it? Right? Rather than actually hurting every other man who's nice, just so that you can, you know, be happy about what you've created, like, so that you feel good. And when I talked about that, Mary was yawning, like, <laughs> yawning and yawning. <laughs> it was just like, and, and every time they yawned, I commented on, and, and now what you're doing is affecting Mary. How selfish is that? You're trying to have Mary shut down from what she wants to do, right, just by your doing that. Like, you're trying to shut her down all the time. And, but as Mary correctly pointed out, it's a matter of actually connecting to the emotion within yourself as to why that connection occurs. So there were two emotions from memory for you. Yeah, there was that first one about the women and then I think the second one was about... Yeah, I can't remember it either. But you eventually... Uh, they haven't been around for a few days, so, yeah. Um, let's go. I just, could I finish off? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, just, um, so the yawning always happens to me personally. Yep. I'll, I'll be just about to cry and the, the tears well up in my eyes. Yep. And then every time I yawn, and, and the further into it, I'll pray to God and I'll be like, just on the verge, all this emotion coursing through me, on the verge and massive yawn. Yeah. That's it's quite frustrating. It's your, it is your own resistance. It's part of your own resistance. Like, I got it a lot when I was in resistance. Um, you are being influenced by a spirit to keep your resistance to your emotions. So you start crying, and what happens is that they, they don't want to let go of you. They know that if you release the emotion... They've heard, it, they've heard what you've heard. They know that if you release the emotion, their connection with you is lessened. Right. I can feel that cloaking now. I'm yep. becoming aware of it yep. and I feel how I get drawn out of reality a bit but I'm concentrating on the breathing and staying there yep. now. And it's some guys, for you, for you, it's actually some guys to do with sexual interactions that want to maintain those interactions. And yeah, I'm getting a lot of that at the moment. Yep. And so what they do is they, is they want to get you out of the emotion that would actually cause you to separate from that interaction. It's funny, I can't even pinpoint... What, it, what the emotion is, I just feel all this well, stuff. That's like because every time you get close to it, they're wanting you out of it. So if you allow yourself to, to look at the block, so what, what emotion do you have where you need the woman's sexual attention? Does that make sense? So allow yourself to examine the emotion you have about, the, about needing a woman's sexual attention. What does that do for you inside of yourself? Yeah, I, I'm aware of it, but I've just got no idea right. yeah, what's going on. Yeah, really. It's related to your mum and the lack of lack of uh, physical touch and everything that was in your childhood. And, uh, ele but allow yourself to actually start thinking about that at least. Um, yeah, but you're probably right. But you, you don't want to at the moment. It's, that's what they're showing you. You don't want to deal with that particular emotion at the moment. That's the important thing. So that's their hook. While you don't want to deal with that emotion, they've got the hook in place. And they can manipulate you through you not wanting to deal with that particular emotion. So many men, by the way, have this justification of sexual interaction. You know the justification that, we, that a lot of men have? You know, we're males, you know, we need to, you know, 
spread our seed or whatever it is that a lot of them say and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's an emotional hook that all of these spirits can hook into. It's a justification of sexual infidelity, right? And that these, these spirits can just hook into that and away they go with that. And it's because of a deeper emotional issue as a male that that would come up. Um, I have terrible yawning troubles. Yeah. Uh, it could be in the morning, uh, midday, at night when I'm sitting down to relax and it goes on and on and on. So is there a process that when this comes up I'm becoming aware of it and to deal with it? And what I would do myself is I would notice every time I yawned and I'd actually take a note, I'd get a pen and a piece of paper and carry it around with me and I'd take a note of what I was feeling or thinking just before the yawn occurred. And I'll just become aware of that. So for many of us, you, what you'll find is you, just before the yawn occurred, you had a feeling that you didn't really like or a feeling, you know, there's something usually that just before that trigger point, point. And the key is to note it down every time. And what you will see build up over a space of a week even or even a day, if you're having a yawning problem quite often, is you'll notice a frequency related to the thought and therefore related to an emotion. So you'll be able to easily identify the emotion. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. John, just at the front just here. Just at the front here, sorry. Um, uh, what I want to know is um, when you were interacting with those spirits with Mary, in the past you've talked about um, praying for those spirits and sending asking for love, so... Which I you did, did Oh, you did do that. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering about that because I've been doing a little bit with kids that I've been dealing with that have got really difficult um, problems yep. and stuff. And I just wanted, maybe it wasn't right. No, yeah. no, yeah, that, yeah. No, I do that all the time. That's uh, given basically what I, what I do. So I'm praying for them to experience uh, some love and, and also giving them some of my love. But, and also, but at the same time, talking to them about the truth. So, so instead of feeling a judgment from me, what they're feeling is me giving them love but also stating the truth about what's going on for them. Does that make sense? And I'll often state the truth very firmly but there's a feeling of love coming from me at the same time and I'm praying for them at the same time. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> emotional injury. <laughs> there's an emotional injury for you there, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was shaking my head. Oh. And Barbara's comment was that men couldn't multitask. Well, they said that men couldn't multitask. There, there are, to be frank with you, this intergender issue is so huge that we often don't even notice our own comments and our own beliefs that actually affect the intergender issue. We believe they're givens. And it's like, you've got to remember that I'm a half, I'm just a masculine half of an expression of one soul. So how is it that we could not understand each other? That can only be through an emotional injury, can't it? So all this definition of what makes a male, what makes a female and all those different things, you know, what planets we're from, Venus and Mars or whatever it is, um, all of it is just an expression of an emotional injury. The truth is men and women are just as capable of each other as and of understanding of each other as each other. So that's the truth. But many spirits do not want to accept that. Many do not want to accept that. And so when I'm talking about masculine issues or problems, many of the women in the audience close down. When I talk about women issues to an audience, many of the women close down because I'm a male talking about it. When Mary talks about it, everybody listens. Why is that? Because she's a woman. Why does that make any difference? It only makes any difference because of what's going on inside of me. That's all it makes a difference to. So if you feel more attracted to hearing from Mary than you do from me, or me than you do from Mary, then look at the emotional issue. And also his it's, public speaking ability is probably in your favour if they want to hear from you more than me. Yeah, see, see Ma Mary's comments like that, I just... <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that called? That's an emotion of unworthiness. unworthiness? Yeah, okay. 
And I can remember what she was like in the spirit world, whereas you can't, right? And, uh, and trust me, you'll see her shine of that over the coming years. And uh, then you'll look back at the comment she made back in, when was it? <laughs> December the 19th and say, hmm, I don't think that was true. <laughs> Mary's had 2,000 years of public appearances. <laughs> Have a microphone over there. Yeah. That she doesn't want to remember. <laughs> oh, you need the mic right up. So. Just going back to the subject of um, I am Jesus, deal with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been wanting to ask this since before break. Um, I'm sort of aware of a worth issue. I, I believe it's a worth issue with me in mm -hmm. regard to you being Jesus. And um, it's sort of that every time I come down to the talks, and I can't believe that I only have to sort of roll my car down the hill with my tub of hummus, and here I am sitting in the second row of, of, a, of, an, of, of Jesus. <laughs> um, I mean, really, that's been going on for over a year for me, yeah, yeah. and... Uh, and uh, you know that I love coming and I wouldn't be here and, and wouldn't keep returning. But part of me just can't believe that I could be um, important enough or blessed enough or, and I'm going to really eke this one out, um, religious enough or spiritual enough or get it right enough or have enough wisdom or be smart enough or old enough or whatever <laughs> to actually be here. That's and a lot, Robin. That's I a lot. know. <laughs> but no, really, I find it hard to believe that I'm sitting here in the second row. Yeah. Um, Listening to a person that can't spell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I mean, part of me thinks um, I have an angry feeling how can the world be so um, bloody ignorant and, and not knowing um, that, that this hall could be only half full? Um, so, in a way, uh, in terms of who you are, I sort of can't believe that the hall can be still after a year. Only, I mean, it's growing, but there's, it's only half full. How can it be that I... Is it, is it my lack of self-worth? Um, how can it be that I'm in the second row when the whole of the world... I mean, the whole of the world speaks every billboard. I've just come back from Vanuatu, Vietnam, India. There are billboards everywhere about Jesus. And I'm actually blessed enough to be living 30 minutes away. How can that be? Okay. <laughs> good question. That's a good question. Very Answer good. that. <laughs> One thing you must understand is every billboard, anyway, is just... It's just a bunch of crap, really, isn't it? But, no. The reason why is because all these billboards and everything, the people that read them, and even the people that create them, most people are not in a state where they can recognise truth yet. So, so what they're doing is they're quoting things from a book that's 2,000 years old, saying something, and then putting that as if they believe that. In most cases, they don't, because they'd already be attracted to the truth if they did. So, to be blunt... A lot of this is not... Uh, the reason why you're here is of one quality that you have. That, uh, so despite your lack of importance, as you believe, and despite the fact that you're not very blessed, <laughs> and despite the fact that you're not very religious or holy or sanctimonious, and despite the fact of all the other things that you mentioned, and despite the fact that you feel you've got no worth, self-worth, you have one quality that is very attractive to God and to me. And you know what that is? Yeah, you seek truth, right? And I'm only attracted in my entire 2,000 years of existence, I've only ever been attracted to people who seek truth. Here, not here, here. You seek truth here, right? That's what you've always wanted. You think back over your life. This is what it's been like all through your life, right? You've always sought truth here. And because you seek truth, you've attracted a person that can give you some. That's what's happened here, nothing else. Now, sure, your statement says, your statement belies the fact that, yes, there is some worthiness issues to work through and everything, but why would God not want you to know the truth if you're seeking it? See, God loves you and wants you to know the truth if you're seeking it. If you're not seeking it, God's going to wait until you seek it. 
And this is the reason why you're sitting in the second row <laughs> and not the Pope. Because, because the Pope has a personification of what's holy and religious, but the Pope is not seeking the truth yet. And I say, yet, he might in the future. Right? But right at this moment, he's not. And because of that quality that's in your soul, you hear the truth. Now, historically, if, if you could know in the spirit world, in the 22nd sphere of the spirit world, the very first people to enter this 22nd sphere like how, how much is said about Mary historically that's actually recorded truth? There's a lot of supposition now about her, right? But in the Bible, there's four, she was mentioned four times. She was my wife and she was mentioned four times, right? Now, Mary was the second person in the universe to enter the 21st sphere state and yet the majority of you have never known her. Now, do you know who the third person was to enter that state? John, the Apostle John, right? You don't even really know him. He's mentioned a fair bit in the Bible, but not much about his character or nature, right? Do you know who the fourth, fourth person was? No, it was actually Cornelius. Right? Now, now how, how do you know them? You don't hardly even heard them at all. And in the Bible, there's not very many records of it. Now, there's four. How many of you have actually heard of any of the others of the 14? The truth is you don't even, you wouldn't have even heard of them because they're not even recorded in history. They are completely unknown people that history does not know who reached the 21st sphere state there were seven in the end, you know, there were seven pairs that eventually entered the seven, 22nd sphere state and you do not know them. You've never met them and the majority of people on this planet or in the spirit world didn't know about them while they were on earth. They weren't famous, they weren't well known, they weren't religious. They had terrible issues of worth, many of them, and yet they are the persons who reached that state first. Why? Because they sought the truth. That's why. They have this really sincere, deep longing for the truth. Many of you are going to enter that state while you're on earth. You don't know it yet, but you will enter that state while you're on earth. No one in history has ever done that. Right? But you will do that when you're on earth many of you, and yet you still won't be well known necessarily. Does that make sense? It just depends on your desires and your longings and where you want to go with those longings. A person who is seeking the truth is really, really dear to God. And all of the effort of the spirit world is focused on people who are seeking truth. And I don't mean seeking truth here, you know, who want to argue about everything. I mean seeking truth here, want to start feeling about everything. Those people are the most important people from that. When I say most important, they're the ones that are responded to the most by God and also all of God's angels. So that's the reason why you're sitting in the second row, because of that desire within yourself. So it really had not much to do with me had everything to do with you and your desire. And that's the beauty of this path, is that when you exercise a sincere desire, it's so powerful, right, that even Jesus will come knocking on your doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> right? and, and, and to be frank with you, like there are many other celestial spirits who are here right now who just, just love the fact that they can associate with people on earth who are now open to hearing divine truth on this planet. Because you imagine if you've been living for 2,000 years in the spirit world and focusing all of your attention on trying to help people understand this truth, do you think, you imagine what a joyful time this is for you, like if you were there? Like, 
you imagine trying to help thousands of people in the spirit world, from the spirit world on earth and never being able to help, really help any of them in a way that was meaningful enough that would help them to get to a place where they'd be happy while they were living on earth. You know, that's a very like, sad statement of truth in terms of that's what's happened over the 2,000 years since our passing. But now there's this opportunity, this r wonderful opportunity that all of you are seeking truth, that, you know, that these spirits are just surrounding you, wanting to help you, wanting to give you encouragement, wanting to, you know, just they're responding to your desire for truth. And, you know, they, they are just want to love you and care about you and oftentimes we don't allow it, but that's what they want. And they want to help us get through this whole process. If you knew how many spirits were helping you, most of you would be totally surprised and overwhelmed and want to cry for a week or two about it. Right? Because there are just so many spirits who are wanting to help. But, you know, obviously they're very dependent upon your desire to seek truth. Because obviously when you're at one with God, you wait for person's desires to be expressed. So this is why I'm attracted to you and this is why all of those spirits are attracted to you too. This is why Mary's attracted to you. Any, and we're not any different to what you will be when, when, and in fact what you are even right now. You're attracted to other people who are seeking truth too. Yeah. Hilda, thing. In a similar light to this seek truth, um, when I first met you two and a half years ago, I asked you a very probably clumsy question. It was on my second day after I met you and I was so overwhelmed by having met Jesus and I said, oh, why on earth am I so blessed that you came to find me? And you said, I didn't find you. <laughs> exactly. You, you, your soul was seeking me and I responded. Yeah. Now, Going uh, forward a little bit, we had an email exchange about a year ago in which you mentioned to me that we were talking about you being Jesus or not and whether I believe it or not. And you stated to me that I do not want you to be Jesus. And I have been chewing on that for a long time. Mm -hmm. Can you help me with my emotion? Because <laughs> I don't think I have really truly resolved that emotionally. Yeah. What happens if I am Jesus? Let, let, let's look at the possibilities here, like from a logical perspective, firstly. Like I'm saying I'm Jesus, right? There's only three possible options. What are the options? I'm nuts and crazy, right? That's option number one. I'm lying. I'm lying. Well, that delusion, you could say that it's in number one, isn't it? Delusional. Deceitful. I'm lying and deceitful, yeah? That's number two, isn't it? E E I T. Full. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, what's the third option? The truth. Oh, okay, it's the truth. So this is three options. Okay. Now, a lot of us don't know it, but we have emotional investments in each option. Right? So what would my emotional investment be to actually feel, oh, maybe AJ's crazy. Like, what, what would be some emotional investments I might have there, do you think? Any ideas? What would be, what would be a good reason to believe that AJ's crazy? Then so, I can disregard everything else he says. Exactly. Can you see that? Like, if, if AJ's crazy, then I can disregard what he says. So when, when I went up to AJ and I asked him, What's this, you know, what's this going on between me and my partner? And I said, well, actually, you've got a lot of anger and rage towards your father. Now, if I believe AJ is crazy, I can say, he wouldn't know what he's talking about. He's nuts. Right? I don't feel any anger and rage towards my father. Can you see how I can have an emotional investment in AJ being crazy? Does that make sense? What about lying deceitful? How can I have an emotional investment in that? Yeah, I can get angry at AJ saying something, can't I, in that state? He's a liar, he's a deceiver, you know, he just wants to control me, manipulate me, and all these other things. I can have an emotional investment in that being true. 
uh, my family has an emotional investment in that because um, then they can excuse every way I act because AJ's the manipulator and the liar and he's controlling me. So they don't have to deal with me saying these things. So Mary's directly confronted her family about some of their behaviour and instead of it being coming from Mary, they just say, oh, that's AJ that's talking. AJ. Right? Because AJ's the deceitful liar, liar, you see. So they can dismiss everything Mary says from that moment on. So what's that? There's an emotional investment in dismissing me as a liar or, or a cheat, right? We also can have an emotional investment in not believing it's the truth. So if it's the truth, what happens inside of me? What happens inside of you if I am actually Jesus? We might actually have to do something. You might actually have to do something. Like, well, you might hear it. Instead of just hearing it, going, yeah, that sounds great. Well, we're great. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, and write down things. Yeah, that was really good. And then go off and not have to do anything, right? Because what that does is it gives me a hook out of actually, like if I can actually say that it's not the truth, then it gives me a hook out. But if, even if I'm, I'm afraid often, I've got an emotional hook of fear into the truth. Of if it's true, then it's going to mean something happening in my life that I don't want to happen. Shall we just put there? And for me, it was like a process of elimination. Well, he's not crazy. He's not lying. I can tell. I can feel that. But to accept the third option, which is the inevitable option, there's a whole other set of repercussions of what that means in the grander scale of my life. So just because you eliminate the first two doesn't mean you've accepted the third one. Does that make sense? So, so Mary's gone through this one with me. She's gone through this one with me. Some of them didn't take very long. The nuts and crazy one didn't take very long. The lying deceitful one took a bit longer because of what parents were saying and family was saying and so forth. Yeah, and it wasn't so much that I felt that from you, but I was so hooked into what my family felt. If they had doubts, then it was very hard for me not to um, get hooked into that with them. Mm. But this one, there's huge emotional impact on Mary if I'm, so what I'm saying is true, isn't there? Like she has more emotional impact than any of you from believing the truth. Right? in her life um, because it personally affects her own identity even. So this is why when I, you know, when I said to uh, her, hi, I'm Jesus, as a pickup line, right, it didn't work very well because she's got the biggest amount of emotional injuries to work her way through about my identity. Does that make sense? Now, I didn't know that at the time. I thought she'd be, you know, say, hi, I'm Jesus, and she'd be swept off her feet, right? <laughs> I'm a foolish man. You are <laughs> I, I, I was delusional. And because uh, actually, totally the opposite thing has really happened. So it really makes me laugh when I read on the internet things like, you know, Mary's, Mary's under AJ's control. And I go, wow, Mary, I'm not doing very good with my control if you're under my control, right? And then, and then when I read things like, um, uh, what are some other things about that? About, me, oh, about me lying. You know, people are telling Mary that I'm lying. We laugh at each other often about that. Like Mary's in the best position to know whether I'm lying, don't you think? Yeah. Like she lives I with me. I live with him. I see him <laughs> literally 24 hours a day. If yeah. he takes off a persona somewhere, no. okay, I don't know where it is. Yeah. So, so you know, she can see whether I've got a persona on or not. Surely. Right, so it makes me really laugh when people are trying to tell Mary, you need to get away from the liar and you get a, get a deceive. And we're looking at each other like, these people obviously have got no idea about what's going on because if they think I can maintain them, or anybody for that manage, matter could maintain an image 24 by 7, it would be very surprising. Like I know a lot of you have felt probably that happen in your own lives for a little while, but sooner or later it comes to grief, doesn't it? Like where you've had a partner or somebody maintain an image. Yeah. If we go up back there. Sorry. I was going to make a point. Yeah. I can't remember what it is now. <laughs> oh, it's about those three things about, oh, the question was about why do you want to resist the truth? That was the question. Um, so, wasn't it? What was the question? Um, you said, I do not want to believe that you are Jesus. That's right. Yeah, you want to resist the truth of it and there is big emotional issues. I feel like, Helga, for you it's similar to me. You've eliminated the first two. Yeah. But not quite accepted the third emotionally 
emotionally. Yeah. So now that could be even issues to do with worthiness. It can be issues like lots of different issues are in not accepting the truth emotionally. So I'm not trying to get you to accept the truth emotionally here. What, I, what I'm trying to do is help you see logically that there are really only three options and that many of you have decided the first two are not possible but you're not yet dealing with the truth of the third. Emotionally dealing with it. Yep. Uh, can we have the microphone there? <laughs> like I see we're all hooked into the truth that Jesus is obviously an emotional, an important emotional aspect of our lives. Now if Jesus, Jesus wasn't an important emotional aspect of our life, yeah. then we wouldn't be connected to this outcome like this. Yeah, and that, that's um, true. And, and if you true. talk to kids, especially exactly. kids whose parents are fairly open, uh, your kids, Angela, they're like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I see that as a fourth point in a sense that... Um, well, no, that's what impacts on number three. Yeah, it's that emotional connection everybody has to Jesus at present. Everybody, and I must say, thinks they have... Yes. to Jesus at present. It's actually the their injuries around Jesus. Because I've had lots and lots of people who I can feel I'm attached to from a spirit perspective, who I walk up to and say hello to, shake their hand, and they have no idea who they're shaking their hand off. So how does that work? Well, it's still in the spirit world, isn't it? Well, no, it's because there's all these things about Jesus should be be whatever, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and that's the issue. Most people have a lot of perceptions of me, of what I should be, that are nothing to do with what I actually am or ever have been. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this began right back in the first century. Everyone was saying to me, instead of the word Jesus, if you just replace the word Jesus with the word Messiah, should be, and they had exactly the same opinions. The Messiah wouldn't do this, the Messiah wouldn't do that, the Messiah... Because remember there was a heap of Bible prophecy, a heap of prophecy from the uh, prophets of the, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Jewish scriptures, if you like, and all of them related to Messiah coming and the Messiah would do this and the Messiah would do that. And I didn't live up to any of them. Yeah, so, but <coughs> I don't want to leave here today and you not tell everybody that they have as much power as what Jesus has. Every, individ I've every already said individual that. person here Many times. must understand that they really do have that. I've already said that. Yeah. Over and over. Yeah, but there's still a lot of reluctance, that's all. Yeah. In me? No, in, the, in, in people because there's the questioning, I suppose. That's their emotional injuries. Mm. Mm. Can you see that? Like, that that's yeah, their emotional I injuries? Can see that, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it's certainly not what I'm saying. I'm saying you have just as much power as... I have just as much power as you. You want to hear from Graham? Where's Graham? Oh, yeah. Far away, Graham. Oh, sorry, sorry, Karen. I didn't see you get the mic. Sorry. That's all right. No, great. Let's go for Graham and then... We're well, sorry, we'll have to just go by our feelings here. Um, number three is the one that gets me. Yep. Like, if I can accept number three, then it completely upsets my apple cart. Yep. Um, Why? It, like... So many of the things that I've considered important in my life aren't. Yeah. And it just brings up an enormous fear of change. Yeah. And that's what it's just... I have so much fear of how good it could be, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's a valid point. You wanna what are the things that you'd have to give up, Graham? What do you mean by that? Well, you know... Um, <laughs> Just one of the obvious ones is just thinking that there's any sort of importance to money. Uh, yeah, okay, got gotcha. You know, and then, yep. there's, then there's a lot of our cultural <coughs> beliefs and stuff like that, you know. Yep. So many things that you, we've based our lives on turn out to be pretty much worthless, you know. Yep. So can you see how we can have a big emotional investment in it not being true or withholding from making the choice of whether it's true or not? Absolutely. It's yeah. just big fear. Yeah. And a lot of that covers emotion, though. That's the thing to th see every single time. If I have a... If, I, if I'm... You, you, I've, I've seen a comment that you made on the net, which basically you, you've discounted that one, you've discounted that one, but you can't accept this one quite yet. Right? You've said you're intellectually sort of trying to grasp around it at the moment. 
And the issue is what emotions, and this is the thing to look at, what emotions cause resistance to truth? All resistance to anything, really, because in the end, when we don't have any resistance, we'll discern truth perfectly, easily, every time. And I've realised that my life is so habitual and that, you know, uh, what you're saying, if I can accept it all as truth, um, I just have to break all my addictions, all my habits and stuff like that, you know, it's just such a daunting task. It's mm -hmm. just look at it and, oh my God. And can you see how, if this is true, you can see straight away it's triggering lots of those, isn't it? Yeah. It's just so big, you know. Yeah. Just, yeah. You just get daunted by the size of it. Yeah. So it's, easy, it's easier emotionally to withhold this decision on this third issue. Can you see that? It's easier for me to emotionally say, oh, I've, I've discounted that one, I've discounted that one, but I just can't accept this one yet. And emotionally what we've got then is an investment and the investments are all about preventing our fears from being exposed. And yeah, if I can add to that for myself, I discounted the first two a very long time ago now, or a yeah, year and a half ago, let's say, um, but haven't fully stepped into the emotional acceptance of three. And what I've found is that um, that's quite a vulnerable place um, when people project things at you because suddenly doubt occurs that um, y you don't even know what you're really doubting. Like you know the first two aren't true but somehow someone's projecting something at you, which is actually triggering another fear anyway. But because you don't want to go into those fears around the third option, suddenly you're in a place of doubt and doubt feels horrible because it's, there's no certainty either way. Um, so that's another part of my decision, I guess, to step into this issue. Um, it's more about my own, well, no, for me it's different, I guess, but I can see for others, like, it's also about your own um, integrity around the teachings, even, like, if, if um, yeah, and emotional growth, I, I lost. You're lovely when you lose it. <laughs> um, who hasn't had a go yet? Can we just, um, Linda hasn't had a go yet. Oh, sorry, Karen hasn't had a go yet, and then Linda. Yeah, uh, this is kind of a comment. Um, in my life, uh, growing up, I uh, wasn't affected by Jesus much. Mm -hmm. I think I'm blessed. Uh, I, I looked around, I heard what people had to say. Uh, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't like what I heard. And I wasn't affected by religion much, which was a blessing. Mm -hmm. And um, so Jesus was sort of not in my life. Mm -hmm. God, Similar to Mary. God wasn't in my life. Uh, and so when I first came to hear you, AJ, I was very open. Okay, he says it's Jesus, fine. Okay, I want to hear what he has to say. Yeah. So you're open emotionally yeah. to, to hearing the message rather than looking at the statement. Yeah, yeah. It, it, well, like my brother says, I don't care if he's Bugs Bunny. <laughs> it's like the message is clear. It resonates with the heart. I care if I'm Bugs Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I, I understand that. And, and, um, you believe, you believe, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but when, when a pers person's just coming to hear you for the you know, first time, it's like they just hear what you have to say yeah. and it either resonates with them or it doesn't. Well, what I'm saying, I suppose, Karen, is that most of the time people come to hear for the first time and they don't realise what's really at play. What's really at play is a lot of unhealed emotions, yep. a lot of uh, spirits surrounding them with unhealed mm. emotions, and all of those things cause them to either make an instantaneous decision not to listen yep. or one to listen. You think about, for many of you, you've given DVDs to people 
that they've taken one look at the first five minutes, said, no, I can't, I can't watch any more of this and given them back, right? Mm -hmm. What's going on there? They haven't even heard the message, mm -hmm. so there's something going on. And what I'm trying to illustrate in this discussion today is there's a lot more at play than just a person's open-mindedness. So for you, yes, you've had not much religious background and, mm. and not much religious programming and not much programming. You're not judgmental generally as a person. Mm. And so when a person says he's Jesus, you're willing to still have a listen. If it makes any sense to you, then you'll listen some more. Yep. Now, not many people are in that state, mm. right? And the reason why not many are in that state is because we've all got so much emotional programming on all these different types of issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Jesus doesn't have to be important in a person's life. No, not at all. In fact, you know, the kind of you, how you, who you are, how you show up, it's like, that's the kind of Jesus I can really believe in. Yeah. If you want to believe in Jesus. Yeah, and I don't want you to believe in Jesus. I, I know. It's, uh, this what I want you to do is believe in God and have the relationship with God, right? Yeah. And, but in the end, what I'm doing is showing you God's way that God created yep. for you to have that relationship. Yep. Yep. So, so I just happen to be the first person who discovered that way. Yep. I'm not the only person who's discovered that way. Mm. There are billions of spirits in the mm. spirit world who've discovered that way and mm. many of you are now discovering that way, right? So, so I'm not the only person that's discovered that way, but I was the first person who mm -hmm. discovered that mm -hmm. way. And all I'm trying to do is show you that way. Yep. And so you don't need to even believe in me, but you do need to resolve the issue of whether I'm speaking the truth about my identity or not, mm -hmm. emotionally. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm not speaking the truth about my identity emotionally, then that brings up a whole mm -hmm. can of worms, doesn't mm -hmm. it? In terms mm -hmm. of what's being said to you as truth, mm -hmm. and also brings up a whole can of worms emotionally. Mm -hmm. Like what's going on inside of us emotionally where we'd actually listen to a person every second weekend mm -hmm. who, who I don't yet believe is actually telling the truth about his own life. Mm -hmm. So there's something going on there emotionally even, right? So and this is what I'm trying to do here in this discussion is raise these issues with you emotionally. So rather than, I don't, I don't want you to go away saying, ah, oh, AJ wants us all to believe that he's Jesus. The fact is that I don't need you to believe that I'm Jesus. The only person that needs to actually accept I'm Jesus is myself, mm -hmm. if I am Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's all. And then obviously the other half of myself, which will be my soulmate, would need to at some point come to accept that. That's the only person that has to accept it in the end. Mm -hmm. However, there's a heap of truth that I'm discussing with you that actually is being called into question if I'm not Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you will have to emotionally resolve. And the way you emotionally resolve it, so getting back to your original question that I think Joy asked, was how you resolve it is all truth is resolved emotionally. Every single piece of truth is resolved in your emotional state. But you have to be in a love-based emotional state for it to be resolved. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, for many of us, we're not in that state, and so we just need to keep developing our emotions. If there's anything to trust, trust that your emotions are the gateway to truth. Right? If you're willing to get to the causal emotions, then they're the gateway to truth. Of course, that's a part of the three things that you need as the necessary things. Remember the necessary things. What is it? I'm seeking divine love. I'm longing for divine love. I'm longing for divine truth. Mm. And I'm humble. Mm. What's humble? I'm willing to experience all of my emotions. I'm, I'm mm. desiring and passionate desire to experience all of my emotions. Mm. That's why the emotional part is so important. Mm -hmm. And without humility, you will never know the truth here. You will never know the truth, even like in a hundred years' time, if you don't have humility, you will never know whether what I'm saying is true or not. Mm -hmm. right? There are many millions of spirits who I've personally discussed things with in the spirit world while I was at one with God and while Mary was with me who are still in the sixth sphere of their existence because they cannot accept those truths. Mm. They perfectly accept that I'm Jesus, but it has made no difference to them in the sense of their relationship with God. Mm. So that's why it's not important whether you accept I'm Jesus or not. Mm. 
except for the fact that if I'm not who I'm saying I am, then why are you listening to the rest of the truths? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the rest of your truths have a huge positive impact on my life. Okay, so you've tested them and put them into action. Mm. So that's given you some faith Absolutely. that they are true. Yep. Yep. So, so. Yep. But at some point in the future, there's going to be this issue between you and I. Can you see why? Sure. Can everyone see why? Because I don't feel you can. There's going, to be, there's going to be an issue between you and I. I am saying who I am and I can't, like, ha if, I, if you say to me, oh, Claire says to me, Claire, I'm, I'm Claire Heblone. And I go, oh yeah, okay, you're Claire Heblone. I've got to have some acceptance of Claire's emotional condition, don't I? To actually have a relationship with her. So in the end, if you and I want to have a relationship, at some point you're going to have to accept my identity. Right. Other, than th other than that, I'm just a teacher to you. And that's fine. You per I'm perfectly happy having that relationship with you. But until we have a, the only way we can ever have a personal relationship is for there to be an acceptance of identity on both sides, actually. Mm -hmm. For me to accept your identity mm -hmm. and you to accept mine. Mm -hmm. yep. It's funny how I <laughs> talked about Claire and it was Claire's phone. <laughs> and it was Dan. And it was Dad. Dan. Oh, Dan. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. What's the time, guys? Yeah. Time goes fast when you're not having, I mean, having fun, isn't it? Yeah. And um, I think it's time to wrap up, eh? Um, what, no, we have to leave the question till tomorrow, right? Um, um, tomorrow the discussion is going to be focused around spirits and what we're going to do tomorrow is all of you who are mediums or who have heard spirits ask questions, what we'd like you to do is ask those questions on behalf of those spirits. And what I'm going to do is direct my answers to those spirits. Does that make sense? So it's sort of like a question and answer session for spirits. Because at the moment there are a lot of spirits uh, around us who would love to know more about their own situation, their own personal experience and so forth and how to deal with different things. And what I want to do is help them address all of those kind of things to help them move forward. So that's our focus tomorrow. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> do you, did all of you enjoy Mary's? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you everyone for being really kind. Thanks.